Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Amy Collins. It looks like we're a small crowd now, so if people want to move down, that's fine. Um, I um, arrived at this conference a little bit late, um, so I don't know who's here today, and I always like to know who I'm speaking to. So who's a medical student? So that's a medical student. Who's a physician? Who's another health professional? Who's something else? Uh, um, who utilizes health care? Who has a family member who utilizes health care? That's everyone, yes. Yeah. So in many ways, health care is um, a really great framework to talk about climate change because um, we all care about um, health care. So I'm going to start, if I can. I have no disclosures. So I'm going to start by sharing a, a, a brief story about how I got involved in this work. I'm an emergency physician, and my journey started actually 17 years ago. It's been a very long journey. Um, it started in a school pickup line. I was there waiting to pick up my fourth grade son. I was in the parking lot. I was texting and idling and listening to music. And my son came out, reprimanded me for idling, told me his teacher had read him a story about climate change and the impact it was having on polar bears, and he made me promise to never idle and to do something about climate change. Uh, it's a true story. Um, and it really was a, it led to a series of aha moments. Um, the truth is I didn't know much of anything. I actually didn't know anything in full disclosure about climate change, um, but I promised my son that I wouldn't idle and that I would learn about climate change, and we did our cross pinky swear. So, which was like our little promise to each other. So that night, keeping my promise as a family, we watched the Algar documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. And afterwards, as a family, we set out to, to do what we could do in our home, um, energy efficiency projects, more composting, backyard garden. And soon it became very uncomfortable living one way at work, home, and another way at work. And I started to wonder why I left my environmental conscious at the door when I walked into a shift at the emergency department why are all the lights on at 7 o'clock in the morning when there are no patients in the room and the TVs are on? The waste started bringing home recyclables. Um, became increasingly uncomfortable. Started bringing recyclables home, if I didn't already say that. Um, and then I asked someone if I could start a recycling program. I was told recycling is illegal in a hospital. And that answer didn't sound right to me, so I Googled um, hospitals and recycling. And I learned that not only was recycling not illegal, um, but healthcare had a very big climate and environmental impact, and there was a lot we could do about it. So I got educated, and I ultimately wrote a letter to my administrative team, um, making my case and asking permission to start a recycling program and a sustainability committee. And I was given permission in about half an hour. Um, that's a, also a true story. Um, in my case, it was the right ask of the right administrator at the right time. Um, and I actually, about a week or two ago, I reached out to that CEO and thanked him. Um, so I led the sustainability efforts at Metro West Medical Center, which is a two hospital health system um, in the western Boston suburbs um, for about eight years. One of the highlights of my career, fun, impactful work, great team, reduced waste, reduced energy, safer chemicals, healthier food. Um, we ultimately led a bunch of awards, um, but it all ended when my leadership changed. Um, I no longer do that, um, but I've stayed very involved in this work doing project work for Healthcare Without Harm. Um, and I now work there full time um, after uh, resigning from the hospital I worked at about two weeks ago. Um, so, Healthcare Without Harm, has anyone heard of Healthcare Without Harm? Yeah, we're a global organization um, working, working to transform the worldwide um, healthcare sector so it reduces its environmental footprint and mobilizing the healthcare sector to be leaders in environmental justice and climate action. Um, our U.S. membership-based organization is Practice Green Health. Anyone heard of Practice Green Health? Yeah. We don't have many Practice Green Health members in Rhode Island. Um, going back to the previous talk, I think that presents an opportunity um, for hospitals in Rhode Island. Um, so Healthcare Without Harm was founded in the 1990s um, in Boston. Um, we are a global organization, um, branches in four continents, um, and a very large reach. Our initial campaign, or one of our initial campaigns, was to eliminate mercury in the healthcare sector. Is anyone as old as me to know we used to have mercury in the healthcare sector? 
So we had lots, you know, mercury thermometers and sphingomomometers. Um, so that campaign started with the return of one mercury-containing thermometer at Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Boston and led to the U.S. healthcare sector eliminating mercury and culminated in a national treaty being signed in 2007, a gl an international treaty to phase out mercury from the global healthcare sector. The reason we um, wanted to eliminate mercury is it's a very potent neurotoxin and the healthcare sector was a um, leading source um, for you know, mercury emissions and mercury pollution. So healthcare that harm has a number of program areas. Um, um, you know, from food and safer chemicals. Um, however, our current focus now is on what we refer to as climate smart healthcare, which is low emissions, resilient healthcare. Um, so, you know, we're focused on climate and climate smart healthcare for a number of reasons. First of all, we're running out of time. The previous speaker said we're out of time. I think it's somewhere in between running out of time and out of time. Um, but this is a really critical decade. Um, you know, we've also heard this, I heard this in the previous talk. First and foremost, um, the climate crisis is a health crisis. Uh, the healthcare sector is on the front lines of the climate crisis, so the sector needs to be prepared um, to care for patients in a changing climate. Uh, we heard about extreme weather events just recently. Those extreme weather events can impact healthcare delivery, access, and supply chains. And the healthcare sector has a very large climate impact, which is really what drives me to do this work. And we also know that the healthcare sector is influential. Health professionals are trusted and influential, and we can have a role in advocating for climate solutions at multiple different levels from the institutional to state, local, national. Um, so that is why we're focused on climate smart healthcare, which is again low emissions resilient healthcare. So I want to start um, with some grounding and some language, um, and really to talk about you know why we are talking about this today. Um, I'm not going to read the first goal of the Paris Agreement because I can never ever remember that, even though I do these talks all the time. Um, but what we need to do to achieve the first goal is. Worldwide, we need to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions by 50% in 2030, that's not that far away, and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And that is language I remember and that we use um, every single day in talking about this um, work. And I want you to notice the second goal of the Paris Agreement, um, which is to uh, around resilience. I think most people think of the Paris Agreement of just being about greenhouse gas emissions, um, but it also highlights the importance um, to um, prepare for climate impacts and to create resilience. Um, and that's going to be another theme of this talk, because you can't talk about healthcare mitigation or any mitigation without talking about resilience. They really go hand in hand. Um, so we are not on track to meet this 1.5 degree um, limit goal, which was that first goal that I didn't read you because I never get it quite right when I try to. Um, stated, um, we actually exceeded that 1.5 degrees Celsius mark in 2023. Now they're saying like, oh, one year doesn't count. It has to be an average over a couple of years, but we're close. We're very close. Um, the, this is um, two things that struck me from, um, you've heard about the IPCC report. This was a follow-up report on mitigation. Um, and these, you know, quotes, really, or these, in response to this report, you know, really struck me is that um, without emissions reductions in all sectors, the goals of the Paris Agreement are going to be unreachable in all sectors because our sector, the healthcare sector, does not get a pass. Um, and the other thing that struck me from this report is we have options in all sectors to at least have emissions by 2030, and that includes in our sector. We don't have all the solutions, but we do have some of the solutions. And I do believe we have the solutions um, for healthcare to reduce emissions by 2030, um, but there are barriers. There are absolutely barriers and challenges. Um, so take home messages, the healthcare sector does not get a pass um, given how impacted the sector is by climate. Um, this uh, final report from the IPC came out about a year ago. Um, it was the synthesis report. 
And this um, the, uh, quote is from the UN Secretary General in response to this report. Um, and this is like my call to action. I feel like it should be like my Twitter or X banner. Um, and I don't usually like to read things, but I'm gonna read this. Um, that this report is a clarion call to massively fast track climate efforts by every country and every sector, again in bold, and on every time frame. Our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, all at once. Um, and this is really a call to action for our sector. Um, you heard about, um, we're now gonna talk a little bit, um, you know, I started to talk about why the sector needs to care about climate change. One of the reasons I stated was of extreme weather events. Um, so you heard recently that extreme weather events um, are these billion dollar extreme weather and climate events are happening. Um, in 2023, there were 28, which is a record. These are extreme weather events that each one causes over a billion dollar in infrastructure damages, but that does not include the healthcare costs. So patients and communities are harmed by these extreme weather events from injuries and illness, um, death, trauma, um, and mental health impacts. But these extreme weather events also um, impact healthcare infrastructure and hospitals are at risk of closure. Um, I add a little um, sort of asterisk to that um, statement I just made that yes, hospitals are at risk of clo uh, closure due to extreme weather events, but there is this incredible opportunity to create resilience, prepare for the climate impacts, make sure your buildings your healthcare facilities are built and operated in a way that they can stay open and operational during and after extreme weather events. Um, so I think you know understanding if your facility is at risk, um, the there really is a strong business case to prepare now. So um, I'm going to tell a little bit, um, a little story about Norwood Hospital. Is anyone familiar with Norwood Hospital? Anyone familiar with Stewart Healthcare? Okay, so. Um, so uh, this is a, is a little story or a series of stories about an extreme weather event that has impacted me, my colleagues, my patients, and my community. So in June of 2020, so that's four years ago, um, late in June, a like, um, couple days before July 1, the new um, academic year, um, there was an extreme historic um, rainfall in Massachusetts, which caused flooding at Norwood Hospital at night. They lost power. Um, they had to evacuate um, over 100 patients at night and transport them to other hospitals. But here we are four years later, construction has started, but this hospital is still not open and it now may, now may never open because of the whole Norwood um, debacle. Um, but this event has had long lasting impacts on patients um, throughout the community and emergency departments. So this hospital closed in 2020. That was early pandemic. So um, Norwood Hospital had 200 beds. So the state lost 200 beds. So this led to emergency departments and hospitals being overcrowded during a pandemic. Um, Norwood Hospital also had a psychiatric inpatient unit. Um, I think, I'm sure in Rhode Island, you have the same challenges with psych beds we have here. Um, very difficult for um, psych patients because we lost these psych beds, led to prolonged ED boarding times with psych patients. Um, and, you know, these impacts, can, you know, can, have continued because these, uh, this hospital still is not open. Um, another um, way that this event impacted my patients is Norwood Hospital had a cath lab. My hospital had a cath lab. So patients from the Norwood community who are having a STEMI or a heart attack for anyone who isn't medical um, were transported to other hospitals, including mine, when they were having a STEMI. What's the number one thing you're concerned about when someone's having a heart attack? Time, time. Yeah, so um, not at rush hour. It can take up to 40 minutes to get from the Norwood community to my hospital. So that's a delayed. Um, you know, time to access medical care, which puts patient health at risk. Um, so again, ongoing impact, I could go on, I have like five, six, seven more stories about the impact, but you get the idea um, that um, hospital closures due to extreme weather events 
can have long-lasting impacts. Um, these extreme weather events can also impact um, healthcare access. Roads might be down, so people, um, patients, um, EMS um, may not be able to access facilities. Communication systems may be down, so people may not be able to call um, their physician or their other healthcare provider or um, 911. Um, so um, it's really important to make sure that um, there's public infrastructure in addition to you know, facility infrastructure um, and work with the community to make sure the hospitals or the other healthcare facility is accessible. Um, these extreme weather events can also impact healthcare supply chain. Um, anyone practicing in 2017 remember the normal saline IV fluid shortages? Yeah, that is because after Hurricane Maria, um, the, two, the two major IV normal saline manufacturing plants are in Puerto Rico and they were destroyed by the plant. Um, so in the U.S. we had a critical shortage of normal saline bags. I remember it well. I remember having Gatorade um, as alternate hydration. Um, <clears throat> And there was also a significant um, shortage of medications, including chemotherapy, medical devices, and surgical supplies. So extreme weather events far away from a home institution can have impacts um, on ability to provide care as normal. Um, and I think that was a, um, a good you know, example of that. Um, so the healthcare sector, um, has a three approach, a three pillar approach to resilience. Infrastructure resilience, we wanna make sure those buildings are built and operated so they can stay open and powered and operational um, during and after extreme weather events. We talked about um, public infrastructure um, resilience. We wanna make sure transportation systems, you know, have a plan to get patients and providers and EMS to the hospital and also community health resilience, which we've, we have talked about, I think, today. We wanna to make sure, we wanna partner with our communities to make sure that the people in the community, including our patients, um, are you know, prepared for the impacts of climate, um, including um, you know, sort of public health resilience, especially our most um, vulnerable patients. Um, so, Another reason that I shared before that we are concerned the healthcare sector is taking climate action because our sector has a very large climate impact. Um, the healthcare sector is responsible for 8.5% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, and that might not sound like a lot, but if the U.S. healthcare sector was ranked as a country, um, we would rank 13th in the world for emissions more than the U.K. Um, our emissions are the highest per capita in the world. The U.S. is responsible for 27% of the global um, emissions. Um, we know that healthcare pollution and emissions harm health, with public health harms on the same order of magnitude as those that are caused by medical errors. Um, and something else we know is that clinical care is the single largest factor driving emissions. That's one of the things I want you to remember um, from this talk. Um, is anyone familiar with scopes, greenhouse gas scopes? Um, so first of all, there are many different types. Healthcare generates many um, types of emissions, many greenhouse gases, not just CO2. Everyone talks about CO2 carbon emissions, but our anesthetic gases, our greenhouse gases, methane from food, the propellants in our inhalers we prescribe, um, are also greenhouse gases, a whole so host of emissions. But all those emissions um, are categorized into scope. So scope one emissions are emissions that are generated on site such as from fossil fuel combustion, from um, you know, transport vehicles, fleet vehicles, um, or greenhouse gases. They are generated and emitted on site. Scope two are purchase sources of energy, such as electricity, steam, gas, oil. And scope three is the largest source of emissions, about 82%, and that is everything else. So our supply chain, um, food, business travel, employee commute, um, so that's the biggest chunk. To date, most of the work around emissions reduction has been around scopes one and two, um, but facilities are starting to measure or reduce scope three, but it's very challenging to both measure and reduce. So if you look at these greenhouse gas emissions um, a little bit more closely, um, there are a couple of things um, I wanna point out. 
So scope one is the, um, let me go over here. This is the, the dark red. Scope two is the bright blue. Everything else is scope three. So we can see, again, scope three is huge. I didn't tell you this, but the hospitals generated about 14,000 tons of waste a day. Anyone in healthcare knows there's tons of waste. But look at waste, I don't even know what color it is. I think it's, I don't know, like dark blue or red. Waste is only responsible for 0.56% of emissions. So as massive as healthcare waste is, it's not making a sizable contribution to emissions. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything about it. It's just important to understand where the impacts are so you understand the greatest opportunities. So bright blue, supply chain, purchase goods. That's our supply chain. The healthcare supply chain is massive. Bright green, investments. So these are investments in companies and industries that um, are climate intensive, such as the fossil fuel industry. Um, so again, important to understand where the impacts are so you know the, where to focus your intervention and where the greatest opportunities are. Um, so again, something I want you to remember, clinical care is the single largest factor driving emissions, not a surprise. Um, but that gives us as clinicians this incredible opportunity to lead actions to reduce the climate, that climate impact. We also have this great opportunity to work you know, in this scope three category um, by looking at how we use devices. Do we use a single use disposable device? Oops. Or do we um, use, oh dear, a reusable one? Um, our, look at our, pharma, our pharmaceutical prescribing practices. Do we prescribe an antibiotic for a questionable UTI and someone who does a urinalysis and someone who doesn't really have urinary symptoms? Or do we wait for a urine culture and make an evidence-based decision? So lots of opportunities for us as health professionals to look at our clinical care through a climate lens. Um, we also have this opportunity to look at um, low value care. Does everyone know what low value care is? It's care that contributes to cost, may harm patients, doesn't have value to patient. Um, and it would make sense that if we reduce low value care, healthcare emissions would also um, decrease. Um, but again, we can, we can look at low value care through that climate lens. And also, probably the most effective thing that could be done to reduce healthcare's impact is to keep people healthy and safe and uninjured so they don't utilize healthcare. Um, so again, lots of opportunities for us as clinicians um, to work in that scope three space and reduce the climate impact of our clinical care. Um, so the healthcare sector, including or, um, healthcare that harm, has a three pillar approach um, to climate smart healthcare or climate action. Um, mitigation, hospitals are taking action or we are encouraging hospitals to take action to reduce emissions across all three scopes. Lots of tools and resources from my organization along with many others to help facilities measure and reduce emissions across three scopes. Resilience, which I think I've talked about a couple of times. Um, encouraging and supporting hospitals in um, preparing for climate impacts and creating resilience and leadership. Um, the healthcare sector is large. It has a lot of political, economic, and ethical influence. Health professionals are trusted. We can really leverage all of that um, by advocating for climate solutions using health messaging and really talking about this intersection between climate, health, and healthcare delivery. Um, and you know, we are really working to try to mobilize the healthcare sector. Um, to engage the climate. We're closer than we were a couple of years ago, but we're not where we need to be. Oh dear, where are we um, My organization um, is very committed to, I don't know why I keep doing this. I don't even feel like I'm touching. Um, in, engaging and empowering health professionals. Um, you know, given that health professionals are trusted, we have health expertise and healthcare expertise. We're often the largest percentage of a hospital or health system. And because of that climate impact of clinical care, we really need to engage and empower and mobilize health professionals, you know, and give them the tools they need um, to um, engage in hospital and health system sustainability efforts. And we're not gonna be able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement without engaging health professionals and reducing that climate impact to clinical care. 
Um, so, you know, how can health professionals um, take action? Um, oh my God, I have time. Okay. So, you know, these are sort of the buckets where people can land. You can take action within the four walls of a healthcare facility. Ask your leader to, you know, take an action, do a QI project, um, start a de de departmental project, um, engage in resilience, look at your clinical practice through a climate lens. Lots of need for more research in this space. Um, you can engage media by doing things like giving podcasts, writing op-eds, letters to the editors, blogs, um, and, you know, engaging in podcasts um, and really talking about this. People, a lot of people have never heard of this. Um, like if I'm on an airplane, someone asks me what I do, I'm like, oh, I've never thought about that. People really do, um, you know, like hearing about this and learning. It's an aha moment for a lot of people, so we have this opportunity to use our voices um, by engaging the media. Lots of need for education, um, getting this into the curriculum. I know there's been some good work done here at your medical school um, to get it into curriculum, but we can educate at many different levels like we are today, and also mobilizing health professionals to engage in advocacy efforts and advocate for policies that support the transition to low emissions, resilient health care. Um, so um, I said I've been doing this work for 17 years. It's been a long, sometimes difficult, sometimes very lonely um, journey. I mean, it's really the best journey I could ever have imagined going on. Imagine going on. I've loved it, um, but there have definitely been challenges. Um, and recently, we have started to see a lot of momentum. The healthcare sector cannot do this own. You know, we need other industries such as the AV, the transportation industry and the food injury industry, pharmaceutical industry to take action. We can't do it alone. Um, and we really have seen others at a very high level engage in this over the co past couple of years. We don't have time to go over all of this at all, but um, the Joint Commission um, recently launched a voluntary sustainability certificate program. Um, for hospitals to re reduce emission, emissions in several categories. Again, an opportunity for your institution, which I do not believe has made a high level commitment. I could be wrong. You know, that is an ask you could ask if you're like, you know, hey, do you know the Joint Commission has this voluntary program? Um, and the other thing um, that has really had picked up some momentum is the health sector, the HHS Health Sector Site Climate Pledge, which was a voluntary pledge. Um, asking hospitals to commit to reducing emissions in line with the Paris Agreement, creating resilience, um, measuring those scope three emissions, and designating an executive leader. Executive leadership buy-in is critical. Um, but you know these uh, these initiatives are voluntary, and we're not going to get where we need to be with voluntary efforts. We need mandates. We need mandated reporting. Um, and measuring of emissions, we need you know mandated planning for resilience. We don't have that, but we just had the tiniest glimmer of hope. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, we were taken by surprise. CMS. I mean, the ultimate goal is for CMS to take action, um, and we were completely taken by surprise a couple two weeks about two weeks ago, where CMS. Um, announced their a team decarbonation. And what am I doing? I don't know. It's, it's almost like my heat or something. <laughs> um, they uh, announced this initiative, um, which is voluntary. Um, but they say their hope is that if this is a successful initiative, it'll lead to something more substantial. Um, asking hospital to reduce and measure emissions, designated an executive leader, um, prepare for resilience, and in turn, CMS is going to provide support. Um, and this is huge news. Um, you know, we are really excited about this, and we're going to be preparing comments. Um, we are also going to be leading a health professional sign-on letter um, for health professionals who support this to um, submit a letter. You know, in support. So this is huge, and this is really the closest we have ever gotten to mandatory reporting. Um, if you're interested in learning more, um, our conference Clean Med is coming up in a couple weeks. It's in Salt Lake City. It'll be closer to here next year. Um, but it's a great way to connect with all the health professionals and others who are doing work around sustainable health care. It's a lot of fun. And we have an annual dinner that's super fun. Um, so I encourage you to check it out. 
Uh, for those of you who are medical students, residents, or fellows, we have a couple of scholarships um, for people, um, for you know, students or trainees to win a full scholarship to clean med. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Time for one question or no questions. <laughs> boxes that you had in terms of steps forward with the, the voluntary sign-in for, for, for climate mitigation. I mean, that's actually in the White House. It's part of the White House's combination of Health and Human Services and EPA and the um, Department of, uh, of uh, Energy have a uniform structure under, under a specific White House office. And they, again, it's a voluntary system. Hospitals sign up and say, we will attempt to reduce our carbon emissions. Not a single hospital in Rhode Island. I know, I know, I, I think you're correct. Yeah, so I, I really yeah, appreciated what the previous speaker said. I like to look at these things as opportunities. And I think Rhode Island has this incredible opportunity. I mean, Boston is, Rocking it, you know, um, Massachusetts. The thing about what they're providing is they're providing free evaluations by the Department of Energy to come in. They right. sign in and they come in and give you a, a full wall to wall analysis of your use of energy and how to reduce right. it. EPA has a granting system, chinka chinka, money right. that as you approach certain problems in terms of like, like some of the things that they're, you know, especially in the the waste end of the hospital system, right? If you mitigate the use of a lot of the waste issues, the EPA is going to provide you some funding to do that. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a, a carrot, a very small carrot, on a very small sector, and there's the free energy audits, but not a single hospital in Rhode Island. Yeah, no, Rhode Island definitely has you know, a tremendous opportunity. I just want to say briefly that another way that um, hospitals can get financial support for implementing sustainable so sustainability solutions is through the Inflation Reduction Act. So, so if you're a health professional and you want to make, have the conversation with your leadership, we can help you, that's what I do. Um, because, I, you know, I think there's so much opportunity here. And I think, this is being recorded. <laughs> Okay, never mind. <laughs> um, but I think just you have such an opportunity. You know, I think there are many academic medical centers on the same level as Brown, probably your competitors, who are taking action. Um, and you know, I, I think you're you're next. Um, you know, again, great opportunities. So there's my email. If you have any questions, um, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Thank you.